Hey guys, this is your host Gooby, and welcome to the Tomb Balloon Podcast, our outlet to discuss, theorize, and enjoy our favorite webtoons with the occasional anime and manga sprinkled in between. Sorry about my absence, guys. So if you listened to my recent update episode, you can kind of get a gist of what was going on on my end. But just to recap a little bit, my mic was not working. I had a week off (laughs) from stuff. And so I am back. Sounds like it's working well. So regardless, I am here. And for those of you who willingly listen to my nonsense, thank you for sticking around. I wrote a script for this episode like weeks ahead and I had meant to upload this sooner before the mic mishap. This episode is going to be talking about webtoon chapters that happened a while back and yes it is a little delayed but I worked really hard on it and I just wanted to get it out there so that way we can go on to the next episodes later on and stay current with the next chapters of these webtoons. And anime. I wanted to talk about some anime but I have a lot of plans. So hopefully we can pull through. (laughs) All right, so this episode, we will be talking about a couple Webtoon chapters, and I will be sure to leave timestamps in the description box. There will be musical interludes in between each segment, so you can go and find the part that you want to listen to the most. There will be spoilers, so there is your warning. And, you know, if you need to, you can go and check the content out before you come back and listen. Anyways. Here are the following webtoons. Unordinary, The Fate of a Rose, Age Matters, The Escapades of Me and Tree, Pot of Gold, and Lore Olympus. Now let's talk about these webtoons. First up, Unordinary, episode 220 by Uruchan. This episode starts off with Serafina talking to her sister over what she would do first with her powers when she gets them back. Then we cue John. John is struggling with the idea of being the one that has to change in this school. We can notice some potential development, but it's getting held back by past traumas that he has suffered. John thinks that the former royals have only changed out of fear. That they were never considerate to the low tiers before this all happened. Before John became Joker and before John became King of Wellston. I decided to read back to some earlier chapters and I gotta say, John really needs a friend. Serafina is his friend, but what with his past trauma, John is having a difficult time wanting to be consoled. The guy lashes out as a defense mechanism, and to be fair, I can see it being really difficult to bounce back from what he's been through. From bullying, then an ambush, to an interrogation camp thing, to more bullying, to another ambush, and the list just keeps going on. The dude used to get his arm broken on the daily. I can see Sarah getting her ability back and legitimately taking him down a peg in order for him to listen to her rationally. The two of them need to talk it out like they did before when they were friends. And I also noticed back in episode 64 that when Sarah, John, and John's dad, Will, were playing poker, the instance the Joker cards were introduced into the game, It is immediately preceded by the queen. The game almost ended due to the disruptive jokers, but they moved on because if you remember, Will, I think, no, not Will, um, John was saying, dad, you didn't take all the jokers out. And Will just said, you know what? Just, it's all right. We'll just play like normal, no biggie. And so they moved on in the game and the card that was came right after the Joker was, of course, the Queen. And I believe that the Queen is obviously, most likely, Serafina. I think we are nearing the end of this quote-unquote game. And when I say game, I am mostly referring to the school hierarchy. Royalty versus low tiers. We are nearing the end of this brutal arc that is John versus everybody else. 
the Joker versus all of the other cards in this school. I believe that the end of the game is near and that that's when we are going to move on to the outside forces that are in this world of unordinary because we have already been shown that there is a greater threat outside of this school and they're going to need everybody. They're going to need everyone in the school to be able to unite in some sort of way. And with the safe house being a good way to unite everybody, regardless of, you know, their ability and level, um, we also get a good idea of this battle that's going to happen. But I know Serafina is going to do her absolute best to snap John out of it. So the following scenes compile the other royals. We see... Eisen or Eason, I'm going to say Eason, confronts Cecile and puts her on blast due to her lack of impartialness when it comes to the school newspaper. Cecile was about to publish an article that John wanted inside the school newspaper. My guess is about the safe house and just as a way to, you know, ambush it in another way. But after that conversation with Eason, she ends up snapping right back into her groove and tears that latest news article apart. This is establishing yet another potential betrayal to John. We then see Blyke and Arlo have a conversation over Arlo helping out with the safe house again and about Blyke's encounter with the headmaster. Now this encounter was about Blyke having the little vial of the amplifier and they basically are just talking about it and we see a lot of development between these two and I like to see the heart to heart between the two of them. It's really nice and it's going to be challenged by a potential rampage from John. He is seen walking past some students who are yelling out Arlo's return to the safe house or at least it feels like they were yelling because John could obviously hear it. And when they're like, oh my gosh, I think he heard us. I'm like, yeah, duh. (laughs) You guys were basically shouting um, in this courtyard or something. John, of course, hears this. And because why wouldn't he? And it's dealt some massive paranoia for him. Whatever comes next is going to be a massive brawl. We already know a good amount of John's past and that we know that his past trauma really influences the decisions he makes now and he lashes out a lot because he thinks everyone is against him or it's not a good level playing field for him he definitely doesn't feel like he is in the right or wrong I can see it just being very conflicting in his head and I feel so bad because like I said I think the guy just needs a friend I just wish there was a way that could really you know get him to want to listen again and it's going to be hard but I think it is possible and that we are going to see this happen soon because I feel it. I feel he's breaking. I feel he is at his melting point and that it is time. We are going to see John develop into a fresh new character. Next, we have The Fate of a Rose, Chapter 44 by Sushi Cat Go. I have been so excited to talk about this episode or this chapter because, I don't know, it was just so fun to see the update. (laughs) And I was like, it was lore heavy. This is a lore heavy episode and it was so good. We got plot twists. We, We just had a phenomenal time reading this episode. Okay, so thank you so much, Sushi. And let's get into it. So I am really surprised that no one has walked into this bathroom yet. And I was so hoping for someone to walk in on the two of them, which is both Dee Dee and Amy. (laughs) Anyways, Amy asks Dee Dee why she is helping her. What is there to gain? Well, Amy, I hereby demonstrate flashbacks. <laughs> also, why is Dee Dee so darn pretty? Like, we have a gorgeous villain here. We are all in danger. <laughs> By the looks of this flashback, Dee Dee is in cahoots with Amy's mother, Georgina, which is a very pretty name, to recruit Akita into Bo again, which we already knew that Dee Dee has been working her butt off to try to 
manipulate or scare Akita back into this, especially with Amy's help. But we get a lot more info in this episode of what's going on behind the scenes. So the shocking twist that we get here is that Miss Magnolia, or shall we say Georgina, lost her crown after Akita spilled the tea of the secret affair she had with Diego. Now, Diego is Akita's ex, and I was not expecting this plot twist. (laughs) Akita's ex-boyfriend, Diego, was just absolutely toxic. And apparently, Amy refuses to speak with her mother because of this whole ordeal. Georgina has a plot of revenge against Akita and plans to use Amy's connections with Akita to get her to join Bo again. Those past incidences, such as the Didi and Coveta incident and her brother's blindness, were intended to be scare tactics for Akita. This was to, I guess, manipulate or scare her to not want to spill the beans. But that completely backfired in the end, of course. So my guess is either they were trying to harm her eyes or they wanted her to go blind instead of her brother in the end. Uh, So, so crazy, which is so sad because Georgina is cold-blooded, no remorse, just a whole lot of narcissism. I am curious how Georgina expects to repair the damage. She intends to use Akita as some sort of scapegoat, but I feel like those allegations can't exactly be backtracked that easily. I feel for Amy, this whole situation for her is cruddy and it's rough to see that her mother can't own up to her mistakes or anything that she has done and instead looks for excuses. And considering the fact that they were trying to inflict harm on Akita, really lets me know and kind of give me an idea of what this incident could have been. Uh, It's just, it's so crazy to think of how much more crazy can it be than like evil contacts that could have blinded her brother. And what could have, I don't know if it would have blinded Akita in the end, but it seems it had some deep, deep damage. And I feel so bad to see that, you know, Akita got wrapped into this. Amy is getting wrapped into this. Everyone else is getting wrapped into this as the story unfolds. And I just have no idea what's in store for us. It is so cool to speculate this and see what everyone else is discussing. It is so fun to read. I cannot wait for more chapters, but I will because I am a patient person. I am a good fan. (laughs) So I will check it out when it happens. And if you have not checked out this Canvas webtoon, I deeply and heavily recommend it. Okay, we have Age Matters, episode 124 by Angelicious. So this episode didn't have a lot of dialogue, but it did provide lots of context and backstory for both Rose and Jackson's relationship. They were actually cute together at some point. It's pretty sad to see how it just abruptly changed and how their relationship just kind of fell apart. So the two of them met in a bar and we get to see Rose with short hair and she looks so cute in short hair. It suits her so well. And Jackson took interest in her immediately. And the moment he wanted to go and ask her out, he went all out. Flowers waited to formally introduce himself, but at the time she was already seeing somebody. And that somebody winds up leaving her for another woman. Which leads to Jackson punching the guy in the face. Well, okay, I'm just gonna say this here. For me, that would be a red flag already. (laughs) Uh, I don't like outbursts like that, but anyways. We kind of get an insight on his character. Eventually, the two of them get close over studying sessions since Jackson was failing his classes and Rose with her big brain and all helped him out. And the relationship develops and blossoms and eventually, they get engaged. Now we all know how that ends there. And it's just kind of just like this gap right before it happens. We see them get engaged and then it just dives right into falling apart. And I don't know if it's more like a, they drifted and that's how he ended up leaving her for another woman or something, but it felt abrupt. But I think this is intended, but I think this is intended. 
I think it's supposed to feel abrupt because we are going to get a complete um, conversation and just we're going to get filled in more in future episodes and chapters. I feel like this is going to be filled in by Jackson's perspective of the whole situation because we get Rose's perspective. We see her and she sees him with another woman and he completely just disowns her, I guess is a good way to put it. He refuses to acknowledge her existence and leaves her and dumps her through a text message. But it was so random and especially with how the backstory was getting shown through the flashbacks, it felt like this guy was pining for her and that he was head over heels over this woman. And to see it fall apart that quickly seemed very strange and I feel like there is another part of this story that we need. Now I'm not rooting for Jackson at all, it just seemed like I want to know more as to what happened. I I think it would be good for Rose to get some closure because I think that would help her move on a bit more and be able to be more open with Daniel. The moment we see his hand and he's holding a resignation at the end of the flashback and it leads to him leaving her and ignoring her existence. So what happened? The guy suddenly starts calling her childish as well because that's what we get in other flashbacks in previous episodes. I I don't know what happened. This guy seemed like he was in love with her and all of a sudden he's just here I don't know, being vicious towards her in a way. What could have possibly wedged their relationship? I just want to (laughs) know. I feel like Rose used to be a workaholic because it was mentioned in the beginning of the story that Rose had a good job but was really into her work. And this could possibly divide the two of them, but it doesn't seem viable enough for the sudden change in attitude for him. When he returned, he said he was going to get Rose back in in the, I guess, the season finale of the last season. So I don't know if this is like a warped mindset or did he have other plans when he met this woman and was planning to get a job? Or was he planning to, I don't know, try to win her back after all of this? Maybe he was trying to make her jealous. Is this like the remarried empress situation? Is he getting a mistress? I don't know. But it is so odd, but it looks like we will find out soon. And by the end of the episode, Daniel has finally shown up and he has noticed these two staring at each other for what, a whole chapter? (laughs) And I mean, by the looks of it, we're gonna get some heat. We are going to get a lot of feistiness out of everybody. We'll see. Here we have The Escapades of Me and Tree, episode 22 by Caitlin Murley. This chapter starts with me waking up to find that Tree is turning into a duck and he doesn't seem to mind at all, but me worries that he would lose his ability to talk to plants. I appreciate that me acknowledges this um, could be selfish thinking. I really like this dynamic between the two of them she actually respects his talents and she respects Tree as a companion. So off they go to find the witch and thanks to Mi's convincing personality and great and great (laughs) interrogation skills, I guess, they managed to get the witch to turn Tree back into a plant. And that witch's incantation was so funny. Basically, You're not a duck. So, so simple. (laughs) Heck, I could be a witch if that's all it took. I wish. (laughs) Also, they completely destroyed that witch's house. So now she's homeless. Um, I don't know what to say for that. (laughs) And well, they leave and start getting philosophical. Tree mentions his purpose in life and it's to find his planter. We have known this for a while. He really wants to find the person who planted him and worships him to the ground. (laughs) And so Mi thinks she doesn't have just one purpose, which is fair. You could have new purposes in life, but I think crucially a person's purpose is to live. And for me, This is definitely what she is doing. She's worried she only screws stuff up, but I'm sure no one thinks that of her. No one thinks that she's a screw up of any sort. Of course not. I mean, the things she has done to help others 
is so much more fundamentally part of her personality than it is for her to be just a baker. She is so much more than that. And I think for me, she really does live up to her purpose. She truly lives her life. She is just so fun and she enjoys what she does as a baker and she just enjoys life. And I think that is just like a a purpose for everybody is just to be able to enjoy their lives. And I think it's awesome. I love her character. She's just so, what's the good word for this? (laughs) Um, She's very colorful. I love it. But also with them talking about purposes, it really, really reminds me of this one conversation from Avatar The Last Airbender. And I'm talking about the one where Zuko and Aang get stuck in that temple after trying to grab the magic golden egg. And Zuko ends up suggesting to each other to think about their place in the universe and to pass the time. I feel like when you're really close to somebody, Those kinds of conversations can happen a lot when you're just hanging out. Like, I feel like this is one of those conversations that you could have at a bonfire or when you're just chilling out in your room and just talking. And it's just simple. It's easy when it's with someone you're super comfortable with. And I just really appreciate their dynamic in this relationship. This friendship is just so fun to watch. It really puts into perspective how close these two are together. And it's really, really sweet. The mysterious figure overhears this conversation about me basically confessing to the fact that she just blew up someone's house. (laughs) And so he ends up launching some boulders at the two of them and off they go on a run. (laughs) We, um, that's where we end off in this episode. And honestly, I'm just so curious on what this guy's intentions are. I kind of feel like he's not a bad guy because if he heard that she like destroyed someone's house and his first reaction is to eliminate the target, then I think um, he might have good intentions, not great execution. <laughs> or I don't know. I mean, throwing boulders at someone is pretty good execution if you ask me. But Um, I don't know. I'm curious to see what happens next in the next chapters. So here we have Pot of Gold, Episode 17, Mi Mundo, Part 1 by Natasha Berlin. So the episode starts off with Mia driving Otto to the surprise party that she had planned. Mia is so excited that she says that they have finally arrived to the destination to a sleeping Otto. (laughs) He is knocked out in this car, Um, poor thing. He mentions that he has had some moving stress and boy, is that an understatement. And so they race to the beach to the cutest greeting ever. I mean, Otto's got some really nice friends and he's got Mia. (laughs) The crew had painted, not painted, they had, I guess, wrote in the sand saying, happy 20th birthday, Otto. And that was so sweet. Before Otto could even finish his sentence, a friend immediately throws Mia under the bus and says it was all her idea. Obviously, their friends are huge Mia and Otto shippers. I really need to know the ship name for this. I need to go and figure that out soon. But this inevitable pairing is too cute. You can physically feel the romantic tension. And I love how obvious the two of them are, yet are so clueless to the lingering feelings for each other. I also adore Mia's bathing suit. Where can I get one of those? (laughs) I... I just love this chapter. I mean, this part of this chapter is gonna be so fun. I can't wait to see where it heads to. And I kind of feel like I might need to maybe divide these episodes when it comes to Pot of Gold because I notice we get little segments until we get the full chapter. I would like to be able to wait a little bit and then when we get a couple more of these parts, then I will discuss the full chapter to its fullest extent. That way we can get a full wholehearted conversation about it. I love the work that you do, Natasha Berlin. It is just so good. And I love the art. This art for this episode was so stinking cute. And I love the colors. Uh, The color palette is just so comforting. And I just, I don't know. It's just so nice to read. It's a nice, cozy read. It's really cool. I am so thrilled for the next installment. If you guys haven't yet, 
go check out this webtoon. Really good. I promise you will not be disappointed. Lore Olympus, episode 147, Pariah by Rachel Smythe. How's about when I read this episode, I was in complete utter shock and I needed to reread this chapter again in order to completely digest it and understand what the heck just happened. <laughs> I don't know if it was the malicious nature of both Leto and Apollo together or the plot twist such a good chapter. All right, so to start, Artemis shows up to confront her brother Apollo about what Persephone's phone call was really about. You know, I had expected for Apollo to pull the brother card, the gaslighting card, the um, manipulative card, the whole, oh, you know, she said this, but this is the real side of the story. And for Artemis to just kind of string along with it and I don't know, I I was not expecting for her own mother to show up and absolutely gang up on her the way they did. I mean, her mom has villain written all over her face and I can barely see her face. <laughs> and it is so scary how much she looks like Hera. I mean, they're practically identical. And the only difference is that they have different colored eyeballs. And it's crazy. It's truly upsetting to see this manipulation right in front of my eyes and to see that Artemis is upset and that they are just using everything in their power to uh, manipulate her. She pleads for someone, at least one person, to be straight with her. And I felt so bad reading that part because honestly, it just kind of gave me a pretty good insight of her previous treatment and why she probably, you know, joined the maidenhood crew and why she just lives on her own and refuses to have visitors most of the time. I can see the reluctancy and considering what I just saw in this chapter with her family, uh, I, I completely understand Artemis and I felt so bad that she doesn't feel like no one is opening up to her completely and that, I mean, for her, it could probably even feel like someone doesn't trust her enough with information. And that can feel pretty daunting when you just want to help somebody and you can't even get the full brunt of it. And when it comes to these two, they are just straight up lying to her. And like, probably this has been something that has occurred so many times in her life that she is just so done with it. And it's upsetting to see her at her breaking point with the two of them. And in the end, she does shut them out and she just poofs away. And I really hope Artemis can learn the truth and not fall for these lies that they are spitting. I hope that she can finally get some sort of closure in order to help Persephone. And I really hope she can be on Persephone's side because I know this family dynamic can easily um, string her back in to this manipulative sense and feel like Persephone is lying or that she'll be against Persephone. And I don't want that. I really want her to be on Persephone's side. I'm so worried that may not be the case, but I'm trying to have some faith. So Leto has been described as a pariah, a social pariah, and eventually she was banished by Hera, even though they both had a super close friendship previously. My guesses are that Leto might have fooled around with Zeus. I mean, just just a, just a bit of a speculation. <laughs> I know Rachel Smythe has disputed the idea of the twins being Zeus's children, but lately I have been hearing a lot of rumors that she has been backtracking this just a little bit. There might be some idea that they could be Zeus's children because we got like some insight on the possible family tree and it looks unknown. So I'm thinking they could be secret love children. And now I feel super bad because although Apollo is so much like Zeus and I don't know if narcissism is hereditary, but Artemis, I'm so sorry if Zeus is your father. That is so upsetting. <laughs> 
it's quite alarming how much the two of them look alike. And I mean more so for Apollo and Zeus because they look alike, their personalities are alike, and by the looks of it, both have some sort of secret plan to overthrow the kingdom or something like that. <laughs> um, not a good, not a good idea or plan, or or anything. It just don't look like a good look for everybody. Besides that knowledge, it looks like these two are constructing a plan to possibly overthrow Zeus. And unfortunately, I think Persephone is gonna have some sort of involvement, whether she likes it or not. She's definitely not gonna like it, and none of us are gonna want this, but she's getting strung along because I'm pretty sure Leto is the mastermind here, and Persephone is getting sought out for her powers as a fertility goddess. Ever since we found out about the hidden power of fertility goddesses, it adds more fear that they plan to abuse her for her powers with the a supposed union. Much like past gods, they either marry a fertility goddess or in Zeus's case, eats them. He literally consumes their power and I fear for Persephone but I really hope she can utilize her powers to combat these two and that maybe she can finally break that cycle where she doesn't end up getting used for her power. I have a lot of faith in her and she's got a really good support system. I don't think Eros was able to hear that last comment from Leto claiming that Persephone was going to be her future daughter-in-law, but that ran chills down my spine. Eros is going to be key in their downfall, and at least Apollo's. Those past hints of the arrows, such as the ones that were saying everyone will hate you, but in reality it's just showing everyone your real personality. And then with the significance of that moment when he split Apollo's arrow in that pole with his very own. And I can tell that Eros is going to have a lot of involvement in order to help Persephone. He already is such a big stable support for her and I can see him having a brawl or some sort in order to kind of, uh, you know, fight Apollo off. I don't know, but, and by the looks of it, Apollo is still delusional like always and he ends up telling uh, his mother that Persephone isn't trying to reconcile with him or anything, that she's still supposedly angry and that she's partying down with Hades. And honestly, I was like, I am not ready for Leto to go and ruin the nice things that are going on with Persephone and Hades. I know this stuff was coming to an end at some point, but it's really hard to see it like come down and unwind because it's so sweet. The two of them are just loving it up uh, in the underworld. And now we got someone coming in that's gonna like, you know, sprinkle in their sadness or something. All I know is that I'm not ready for that. <laughs> and unfortunately, it looks like Persephone is gonna have to confront Apollo again, but hopefully she can have her support system, which is Hades and Eros and even Hades dogs, all of the underworld dogs. <laughs> I I'm, I am just really looking forward to the next episode. And so far it is, just a thrill to read every week. All right, so this episode was cut short. I wanted to discuss an Attack on Titan episode, but I wanted to possibly separate the two of them so that way I can discuss more Attack on Titan episodes since we have been getting a lot of content recently. And as I am recording this today, I plan to watch the next two that are getting released this Sunday. Um, really excited to watch that and hopefully I can have a really big juicy episode about everything that's going on. By the looks of it, we are going to get a lot of crazy stuff and I'm ready for it. So my question to all of you this week is what is your favorite romantic relationship dynamic when it comes to anime, manga, webtoons, you name it. This kind of stuff was trending a while back on Twitter where they were asking, what are your favorite tropes? What are your favorite relationships um, in anime, manga, and even webtoons? It was just circulating around for comics as well. I'm really curious to hear what you say because for me, my favorite 
um, romance dynamic is essentially when characters trust each other so much that they could simply look at each other and know what they are thinking. I would love to hear your answers via the SoundCloud comment section, or you can let me know your thoughts and opinions of what we discussed today in this episode, along with your answers for this question of the week by messaging me through either of my social media handles, both my Twitter and Instagram handles are the Tune Balloon. I would love to hear from you. Also, definitely tell me any other webtoons, anime, or manga you are interested in. I may talk about them in future episodes. The Tune Balloon podcast can be listened to on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Now that we got all that info out of the way, let's end this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time to listen to my humble podcast. I look forward to talking with you again. This is the Toon Balloon Podcast. I was your host, Gooby. See you next time.